Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm really excited for this panel because in Silicon Valley as an AI reporter, we often are closely chasing the latest and greatest AI startups and product developments, but today we're actually gonna get to talk about what that looks like uh, when it's actually executed, right? What day to day, uh, how major businesses are actually implementing um, these new tools into their workflow. So first of all, I want to pose this question to all of you. Um, AI isn't new, and you all know that. You've, you know, you've looked at your body, you've all been working in AI for years and years. But we have seen rapid progress in the fields of generative AI in the past two years since the release of ChatGPT, from chatbots to AI image models that can create hyper-realistic pictures um, to increasingly agentic technology. What excites you the most about the development we've seen in the past few years in AI? And how are your companies taking advantage of that? So I'll start with you. Yes. Sure, yeah. Um, no, it, it's, it's amazing, you know, just what has changed over the last few years. And, and as you said, um, you know, AI has been just a part of, you know, Walmart's DNA, um, you know, for, for a very long time. I think, you know, when it comes to things like generative AI, you know, we've seen sort of a step change in terms of, how, uh, how it can actually be used to um, just improve how it is that we do everything um, you know, uh, across the company. We focus on uh, how it is that we can use it to improve the customer experience uh, and how it is we can improve our associate experiences, how it improves our operations and, and even things like content enhancement. And uh, examples for us where you know, we're, we're um, practically using you know, generative AI, um, you know, something um, as, as, uh, as, as, as sort of common as the customer care assistant. Um, we've seen a step change in terms of leveraging generative AI to allow our customers to express to us what their needs are, being able to understand that. And we've seen a double um, improvement in terms of their workflow efficiency as a result of that. Uh, what that allows us to do is it allows that our, our customer care agents to actually spend more time on, on you know, problems that are more um, that are that are more complex uh, as a part of it. The other example that I'll give is, um, and that's been exciting for us, is that you know just being able to use it to enhance the content um, within uh, within our um, within our site. Um, we've gotten um, improvements on 850 million pieces of, of content within our catalog, and that just makes it really easy for our customers to find the data that they're looking for, our associates to find the data that they're looking for, um, and that's just scratching the surface just with generative AI. So. Great, and Ashok, how about at Intuit? What, how have you been able to uh, make use of this new wave we're seeing in Gen AI? Well, Shreem, thank you for having me on this panel. It's great to be here. We're using generative AI, simply put, to revolutionize the way customers interact with our platform so that work can be done for them with their permission. If you're a small business owner, if you're a consumer, um, you want to have your time spent on what matters to you most. And that might be interacting with customers, it might be interacting with your kids, it might be interacting with your family or your friends. And you want work done for you. And what we're seeing here is an unprecedented opportunity to have work done for our customers with their permission. Let me tell you about uh, one area that we're very excited about. So we recently announced, I think it was last week, we announced that we have created agentic workflows these are workflows which actually do work on behalf of the customer. We're ramping these up and we're seeing unprecedented engagement rates from customers with this. We have over 600 million customer interactions that are powered by AI uh, every year. And each one of these is uh, an experience that's tuned for the customer. We have about 4 million models that are helping people do automatic transaction categorization. And that's just the beginning of the story. If you look at our uh, journey in AI for the past many years, has really been on focusing on end customer needs and benefits. Great, and Patrick, what about you? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, Shireen, thank you for having me. Um, so if, for Rockwell, it's interesting. We are a Microsoft go-to-market partner, so we got pretty early access to open AI. <clears throat> and I think we found uh, a lot of excitement, and I think at some point we were like a hammer looking for nails uh, because everything was exciting about generative AI. Um, it took us about six, 
nine months to calm down and really start to figure out where can we apply this technology. And uh, similar to what both of these colleagues just said, we're finding really good cases in our, our customer segments, our sales area, uh, filling out contracts, responding to RFPs. We're also using 4.omni for language translations. Um, and really our goal is to um, try to make the body of work that exists in segments where we rely heavily on interaction much more simplistic. Uh, Patrick, I love that answer and what you were saying about <laughs> for a while it's like the hammer looking for the nail and it took some time to figure out, well, how do you actually use this in yeah. a way that makes sense for your company? Um, I'm curious, how do you actually do that? How, there, you know, there's a lot of substance to AI that can also be a lot of hype. So how do you know when a new product or such a new technology is actually ready for prime time to be implemented in your business? Yeah, that, I mean, that's really what you've heard thus far, right? I think what you're hearing is the technology has been there, the ability to use it has been there. I think the struggle for us has been our own, uh, our, our own people, actually. Uh, so I've said this before, I don't think technology is a rate limiting factor anymore. I think that's long gone. Uh, it's our imagination of how we come up with the cases. Um, the previous guest talked about some of the use cases. We're doing exactly the same things. Uh, looking for ways which we can apply it to anomaly detection, but in our case, it's in cybersecurity. Uh, we as a company also sell these services to other companies, so we like to, uh, we call it rock on rock or rockwell on rockwell. We try to, I guess, eat our own dog food and see if it works for us before we can actually take it out. So that makes it more conscious for us when we look at the products and we try to understand can it be applied somewhere else? So, you know, I don't think there's anything magic about it. It just takes some time. Makes sense. Ashok, you mentioned agentic technology. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means at Intuit and how, you know, the end consumer may see some of that in tools like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Credit Karma, MailChimp that we're all very familiar with? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the most important thing to keep in mind is that Agentic workflows, agentic technology is something that is based on generative AI. Now, about two years ago or so, we started developing uh, generative AI technology and we created the generative AI operating system. We call this GenOS. This is proprietary to Intuit and allows literally thousands of developers to build new applications based on it. One of the key components of GenOS is something called Gen Runtime. Gen Runtime has an orchestrator in it that is powered by a large language model that can do optimization of tasks over time given multi-input and multi-output. So that's a lot of jargon. What it means is that it can do what you and I do on a daily basis, which means that it can, for instance, look at what needs to happen, plan out a path as time moves forward, figure out what has changed in the environment, dynamically adapt, and then take action again, all on behalf of, of the customer. So for instance, you asked for an example. In the accounts receivable, accounts payable area of QuickBooks, so this is where people are bringing money into their company, sending money out, paying bills and invoices. In that portion of the product, we've created agentic workflows that actually automate a lot of that so that you don't have to spend your brain power going through and figuring out, did this bill for Target, was that personal? Was it for a business need? If so, if it was for a business need, was it for uh, goods? Was it for uh, household supplies? Was it for uh, office equipment? You don't need to do that. It can figure these things out automatically and it can do it at scale. This is just one example and as we're going forward, we're starting to see applications, for instance, in understanding uh, small business owners' uh, finances. So using generative AI and an interactive uh, agent-based architecture and framework to help a customer understand their own small business using uh, using the, the, these technologies. So these are just two applications. If you look at what we're doing, we're literally reinventing the entire company 
with AI. It's our stated strategy and has been for many years. And this is just one part of it. There are so many other places that we're using these technologies. Makes sense. I think for anyone who's used a, an AI chatbot, even the latest and greatest models still hallucinate, right? Meaning you still can get a really obviously wrong answer that anyone with common sense would, would know is, is incorrect. So how do you make sure that when someone's doing you know, their, their QuickBooks accounting, that you are actually getting and trusting um, this tool, this agentic tool with the right That's tool. a fantastic question. And I think one that really deserves uh, some thought and, and a good answer. So let me take a shot at it. Generative AI operating system has many layers in it. And I mentioned Gen uh, Runtime, uh, which is the planning and scheduling and reasoning capability. But there's also the large language model component to it. That model is actually separated in the following way. As data comes in in the form of a prompt, we actually know what's going in the prompt. That generative AI orchestrator is looking at all the data that's available to it, bringing it in. But the fact is that it might make a mistake. These things can happen. And so we actually have a guardrail there, which is built by another component called GenSRF. This actually monitors what's going into the large language model. What comes out of the large language model is, again, looked at by GenSRF. And this is just one of the techniques that we're using to reduce the hallucination rate. The second thing that we're doing is actually inventing new math that can be used to uh, change the way the prompts are actually constructed. And by doing that, we're also seeing reduced hallucination rates. Ultimately, what we find is that as we employ these technologies, hallucination rates uh, are, are way down. And on top of that, we're building um, fallback capabilities so that if there's an error, it goes to something where we know it's 100% correct. Very interesting. Um, Desi, Walmart is one of the biggest consumer brands in the world, right? And the biggest employer in the US. How much is generative AI a part of both the consumer shopping as well as the employee experience at Walmart? And how do you scale up um, in that respect? Yeah, it, the way that we look at, at um, AI and generative AI is it's really just, um, it's part of what it is that, that we do. So, and um, with anything that we, we look at from a, um, uh, as, as we build it, it's really looking at what's the customer problem that we're trying to solve, what's the associate uh, problem that we're trying to solve, and then bring the best capabilities to bear to be able to do that. Uh, and you know, whether that's generative AI or, or you know, more classical AI in order to do that. But at the highest level, what we're trying to solve for are, are two different things. Um, with, with AI, we have no shortage of problems that are really around how is it that we automate or remove friction for our customers and for, uh, for our associates uh, in, the, in the things that they're trying to get done uh, every single day. And then how do we actually move um, with speed uh, and at the scale, as you said, with Walmart? And the way that we look at that is by making sure that we've got the right foundational capabilities in place. Uh, Shuk talked about Gen, Gen, um, Gen OS for, for Intuit. Um, within Walmart, we have a number of foundational capabilities that we've been building on. And because we've actually had them in place, it's allowed us to move really quickly with Gen AI. We have conversational AI capabilities uh, that we've used that allow um, anyone within the company to build conversational experiences and to do that quickly and to do that at scale. Uh, we have foundational models uh, that we've been building on. Um, we talked about how generative AI is, has existed be you know, before this latest wave. Um, we've been working on that and codifying uh, with Walmart's data, um, you know, all, um, uh, the, the language of Walmart and making that available to all of our development teams so that they can build things um, you know, <laughs> very, very quickly. Uh, and um, as a result of that, that has allowed us to solve a myriad of problems uh, you know, across the company and do that. Um, you know, very quickly given that we've got two million associates and hundreds of millions or 250 million customers that interact with us uh, on, on, a, uh, on a daily basis. Um, yeah. And how do you decide when it makes sense, like you're saying, you do have your own models to develop the technology in-house versus partner with some of these newer companies or existing tech giants that are expanding their AI capabilities. Yeah, again, it comes down to the type of problem that we're trying to solve, and we let our customers and our associates guide us in terms of, of what makes sense. When it comes to, um, you know, to um, in, the, in the case of you know large language models, when it comes to how it is that our customers speak retail, in that case, you know, we want to make sure that we have 
um, you know, models in place that are specific to Walmart, that understand the Walmart data, that are constrained to the Walmart data, that are constrained to our, uh, to our um, uh, best practices and, and our core values, but it's complementary to the other capabilities that are out there. So it's not a one size fits all, and part of the foundation that we've put in place is to make sure that we are actually um, able to plug and play and you know, combine the right, um, the right capabilities at the right time for the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, in order to create the best experience for our associates and for our customers. Makes sense. Patrick, you mentioned the Microsoft partnership. I'm curious um, if, uh, just opening up the floor here, how these partnerships with other vendors have been going and implementing some of these uh, really innovative AI tools. Yeah, and I, I think for us and our teams, and even from my role here and my previous role, I come from a biotech background, we are very big into partnerships. Uh, and. While Microsoft is a great company and provides us a lot of insight, <clears throat> there are a lot of things we learn from really small companies. Uh, example, um, you know, we built a, a predictive model for forecasting and very quickly realized that we need a lot of causal stuff in there. So we found a small company that does nothing but causal work for financial forecasting. Um, and I think the more we are able to look at these smaller companies that are really good in trying to bring specific skills to us, the better our internal teams get. And again, our goal is always, if we build something selfishly, we're always looking to say, see if we can commercialize that. Um, because ultimately, Rockwell in itself has been very good in the OT, IT convergence. They've been around, that's, their bread and butter. It's adding all these other components to that now uh, that, that help when we talk about the partnership. So yeah, we're big into that. Makes sense. Ashok, anything to add on when it makes sense to partner versus in-house? Yeah, so uh, we use best-in-class technologies. And in Gen OS, um, we have large language models from uh, the major vendors. But we also have our own models. And um, to give you an idea, we have about 10 major classes of models operating in Gen OS right now. And this allows our developers to choose whichever model is uh, best for their purposes. And then we have a leaderboard that allows them to analyze that evaluation framework that helps them understand how these models are performing across a very large number of Intuit specific use cases. And so these are the approaches that we take. We are also building our own large language models based on open source um, models that are fine-tuned, that are actually much smaller than what you would find in the commercial world, and they're much more accurate. They have lower hallucination rates, and they also have the benefit of having very low latency. So these are very fast models, and at the scale that we're operating at, makes a big difference. So again, about 600 million uh, interactions per year, 65 billion machine learning predictions per day. Makes sense. How are you all measuring um, the effectiveness of these newer AI tools? I know it's still early for some of them, but how are you deciding, okay, this does make sense, or maybe this was overkill and we can actually go back to an older technology, um, or this wasn't the right fit? So how, how are you deciding that? So we look at customer benefit, uh, number one. And we're, uh, for instance, in the, in the last tax season, we served over 20 million people with generative AI experiences. And we ask them, like we literally do follow me homes, and we ask them, but we look at the data, and we look at the responses. And the uh, customer um, interactions and the re-engagement rates with some of these uh, models are very, very high. And so we know that these are experiences that customers want. I hear numbers like 150% index to control. What that means is that in an A-B test, where the, the treatment is the A and B is the control, 150% adoption over the control. I just hear these statistics very often in different use cases across the entire company. So what we know is that consumers love this. And remember, this isn't just about chatbots. This is literally about reinventing the way work is done and it's a way of doing it in such a way that it puts the power in the hands of the customer so that that person can determine how they want their data to be used and how they want their output to be uh, taken action upon. And Desi, how about at Walmart? How are you measuring the effectiveness? And if there aren't you know, specific metrics you can share, are there maybe certain examples of where you have seen yeah. 
that these tools work really well. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's very similar to what Ashok said. It starts with the problem that we're trying to solve, and you know, the and are, are we moving the needle uh, and, and being effective in actually solving that problem, whether it's for the customer or for the associate or you know within operations. So a couple of examples would be. Um, one, you know, we recently, you know, released our just exit technology with, with Sam's Club. You know, the problem for our customers, like they hate standing in the checkout line. <laughs> um, so the, the faster that we can get them, um, you know, checked out, you know, the, the better. Uh, and with all of the, you know, the work that we've done with AI, with computer vision, and you know, putting that technology in place, you know, we've seen a 20% improvement in the speed at which you know our customers have been able to, to check out. Um, when we look at things like for operations for um, mid-mile delivery, um, <laughs> we've applied AI to basically optimize all of the, um, the routes that our drivers are taking and how it is that we pack, uh, pack the trucks just to make as, as efficient as possible. And then when we took a step back and actually take a look, took a look at the impact of that, we were able to eliminate um, 33 uh, million miles, uh, un unnecessary miles, uh, driver miles. And so uh, that's a big impact just within one year. It's also a big impact in terms of the reduction of, of, of emissions. Uh, and so, um, you know, it really is just a, a matter of if we're aligned to here's a problem that we're trying to solve, here's how it is that we measure success. And then if we see the impact, then we're going to conti continue to uh, continue to invest in that. Makes sense. Um, and how about, you know, what are the biggest challenges in implementing these tools? There's also that this component of privacy, which we touched on a little bit but didn't get into. So are the biggest challenges around kind of user trust and keeping data private? Is it around, um, you know, just the reliability of the tools, uh, implement, like, what, you know, all of the above? But I'm just curious to hear if you had to pick kind of one, um, one drawback or issue in, 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 in right now in implementing these technologies, what would you say they, it is? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would call it a drawback, <laughs> but uh, I'd say one thing that we, we pay attention to very, very uh, closely is how is it that we also protect the customer, whether that's um, you know, protecting their data or protecting their, their interactions. And from day one, whenever we are working on these types of, of models, we have a digital, digital citizenship team that works with us. And you know, we are very much aware of all of the, the, the regulations, um, legal considerations, reputation risk, all of those things you know, come into play. And we work together um, you know, with, our, um, with our digital citizenship uh, team to basically work through what's the best way to basically solve that and put the right guardrails in place to basically minimize you know, the, the impact um, you know, to um, ultimately to our customers and to our associates. So it, it's not just removing the friction um, you know, for our customers and associates, but we also want to make sure that we're doing it in a very safe way. And that requires a lot of careful thought uh, as we work through this and a lot of experimentation. I think the other piece of this that, um, that is, is somewhat of an advantage you know, for Walmart is because we are so large and we have so many um, associates, we're actually able to do a lot of testing internally before we put something out in front of the customer because we really want to make sure that we're getting it absolutely right. Makes sense. What would you say is the biggest challenge with implementing some of this newer AI technology? So um, I would agree that you know making sure that the data governance, the AI governance, privacy, and security is uh, well taken care of. And I think Desi, you uh, outlined it very well. What I would add to that is that we're literally reinventing into it. This is a 17,000 person strong company, and we're changing the mindset changing the way product is actually developed, changing the way we create new and revolutionary experiences. And the, the outcomes of, of our work has been quite extraordinary. So for instance, in the last four years, developer velocity, that means how fast uh, engineers can write code and, and, and put it into production has gone up by a factor of eight. Um, what we're seeing is that the use of generative AI technology is enhancing the ability to do experiments by 30%. So this is a reinvention of literally every corner of the company. And as we do that, we're making sure that the safety, the privacy, the governance, and all of the other elements are well uh, adhered to because we welcome and we understand that consumer preferences are going to change <coughs> with respect to time. That people's uh, issues and their, their notions of privacy are gonna change. 
that's fine, and that is something that we're building into the platform so that as those preferences change, the platform can evolve along with it. Yeah, and I would, I, <clears throat> I would echo also doing some of the same things. I think we early on tried to make sure we wanted to protect both the employee and the company. We, we locked down a lot of things, uh, uh, but we also created a lot of internal tools like a generative AI playground that allows people to, to just go in there and, and learn and experiment. And then when they get to a certain level, you can take it to the next, uh, next level. But privacy is a big deal for us uh, because we, again, we deal with many, many big clients, much like they do. Um, but yeah, I think for us, uh, someone used the term earlier, it's really changing the way we work. It isn't you know, I know you hear the term change management, but for me, it's it's really what you did yesterday is not good enough today, uh, and what you do today is not going to be good enough tomorrow. And it's for us, where do we meet our customers, where they are, and and really every moment matters. So that's how we approach everything. Does anyone have like a product wish list of like if if only the AI could do this, or we're yeah. a little better at this, then we could, you know, unlock some much greater value. Is, is there anything like that that you all have on a wish list? Open the floor to anyone. Uh, if you can think it, you can uh, automate it. If somebody said this to me, I'm not sure you can do that, but if you could, I'm all for that. If you could do what, sorry? If you can think it, you can automate it. Uh, ah, okay. Um, and the previous CEO of a very big company used to say that to us. If you can think it, you can automate it. And I'm like, I wish I could, but you know, Jeff Hinton just won a Nobel Prize with that philosophy, so maybe we can. Great. Well, anyone else wants to add to that? So um, a little bit closer to the earth, I think that um, what would be very, very powerful, I'm very excited about the confluence of multimodal uh, systems. So this means systems that can reason, but that can also take in data from a number of senses, the senses that we all have, the five senses, but then also other types of data, infuse it and do, um, and do reasoning based on that. Now, you might say, well, doesn't ChatGPT or some other model do that today? Not quite. Um, those models are actually doing fusion in a different way. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about here is a much uh, deeper analysis of, of data that would be done by the model, and then reasoning that's based on fact and the differentiation between, frankly, fact and fiction, which is something that humans can do very well and something that machines do need to do better. Desi, anything else on the wish list? Yeah, look, I would add, you know, to what Ashik said. It's, it's, you know, um, it is a misconception that these LLMs are actually doing a lot of reasoning, but you know, being able to sort of truly reason, truly understand, um, you know, what what it is that you're trying to do and trying to trying to achieve. If we're able to really start to unlock that uh, and those different types of per, uh, different types of perception that is really going to you know, um, really take things to the next level and to sort of take it back into fantasy land a little bit. I am an anime fan, and a lot of what it is that drives me you know, in, in, with anime is you see a lot of you know, the future, what can be done. Uh, and I think if we have these sorts of tools, if we have that, you know, the, the AI that can start to really reason, we can start to realize, for me, a lot of the things that I love about anime and science fiction in the future. So. Great, love that. Well, a round of applause for our panel, please, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thanks so much.